Oh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Yorgos Fagas uh, from Tinder National Institute. And um, here we are today on the 14th of April to celebrate the first World Quantum Day. Um, we, this, is, this is an initiative uh, across uh, the world uh, to establish uh, um, a, a celebration day for uh, the quantum reality and uh, realizations. Uh, as I'm going to, as we are going to explain a little bit later over the next 45 uh, uh, minutes or so, um, why why this day was chosen is because um, it represents uh, one of the fundamental um, constants in terms of the quantum reality, and that's a uh, Planck's uh, constant. Uh, constant. Uh, it is um, uh, the four, The first three digits is four. Point fourteen, and therefore that is the April 14th. Now, every day is a quantum day uh, because uh, our reality is based on quantum physics and uh, as uh, is going to be discussed a little bit later. And uh, also uh, what we will be looking at is that um, in, the futures, in the future, we are going to have uh, even um, more um, realizations or engineered solutions based on quantum physics. And uh, therefore, we will be looking at uh, celebrating quantum almost every day. Before we do that, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Tyndall National Institute and uh, why uh, we are interested in uh, um, quantum uh, realizations on the quantum engineering, uh, as, we, as we call it. Uh, Tyndall National Institute is uh, Ireland's uh, major institute in digital technologies. Um, and uh, essentially what we do is we are looking at the uh, uh, fundamental, really difficult uh, uh, problems to solve that they require uh, significant scientific and engineering um, working to, uh, to enable uh, information and communication technologies. We are based in, um, in, in Ireland, in Southwest Ireland, in the city of Cork, and we have 600 researchers on site uh, from over 50 nationalities. Uh, why quantum and why quantum engineering at Tyndall? Uh, traditionally, we came from, um, let's say, a, a, a microelectronics uh, uh, background, and we've been working on, uh, a, on information and communication technologies for over 40 years now. And uh, in the, it, it became apparent as uh, we transitioned that these uh, electronics are in everyday life. Uh, we, uh, we, we bring those into applications in the uh, agriculture, in the health uh, problems. And we see that in the future, many of these um, problems are going to be addressed by uh, the revolution or the next generation of uh, devices that are going to be enabled uh, through quantum engineering. So uh, what we are doing is we are looking, um, as I said, at uh, these um, fundamental uh, problems uh, in terms of science and engineering from the, uh, from the basic phenomena and also the platforms that allow us to uh, look at this uh, phenomena. Uh, we are looking at the uh, materials and nanostructures which uh, um, demonstrate uh, quantum properties. We take those into devices to make quantum devices. We integrate those uh, to be useful uh, in terms of the applications uh, based on, on control uh, interfaces and, and systems. And uh, today I have with me um, uh, three more people, uh, Emanuele Pellucci, who is going to introduce the fundamentals around uh, quantum science. I have Philip Murphy, who is going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, what quantum uh, physics or quantum mechanics has enabled to do us in the past and is going to enable us to do in the future. And then uh, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about more specifically what we do at Tyndall and we have also Gedimin Azyuska, who is going to give us a deep dive on, uh, on a quantum experiment. So um, this is Emanuele Pellucci. He is the head of a group on uh, epitaxy and um, nanoscience 
and he's going to talk to us about uh, what is quantum science. Hello, thank you very much, Georgios. Um, so what I was asked to do in this presentation is to answer, you know, to give with few slides what is quantum science. And typically this is a little bit of a challenge, um, which is resolved on the internet uh, with explaining how complicated quantum science is and how hard it is. So what I'm trying to do today, actually, is something a bit different, try to explain what is not so hard in quantum physics and why this can be exploited for new applications. So, um, so what is not so, what is odd and what is not so odd at the same time? So quantum particles, an electron, a neutron, a proton, are actually not particles. They, the equations that describe their behavior are what we call field equations. Now, what is a field? A field is a lake where all the molecules in the lake are connecting to each other. So you could touch uh, somewhere, this touch propagates and there's some behavior in the lake. So you throw a stone and you get the ripples in the water. So the whole thing is not defined by the in individual components but is defined by the collective behavior, which is some physical rules which need to be obeyed. Um, other fields, for example, when you talk to your phone, you use the radio, and the radio is an electromagnetic field which is transmitted between your device and another device. So this is a field, it's defined, it's something which is defined in every position and point in space and time, and there's a rule on how that field behaves, okay? The rules can be very different, but they have some features in common. And this is where it is very important to uh, understand. So I'll give you an example of what is difficult about fields, but is also surprisingly simple. Um, so I have an example here. And this example is the uh, a pendulum. So we have two penduli with a spring connected. This is a very simple field whereas you have to actually object with some rule linking them together. Now, this very simple field, uh, you can actually see from what you, from the screen, uh, can behave in a very odd way. And it's not obvious how you describe this behavior, and you think that it must be some complicated mathematical tool. Actually, it turns out that this is a very simple description. And you can see that I put A and B, which is ball A and ball B, but then you have mode one and mode two here on the screen. And mode one is this expression here. Now this is cosine of something with omega one and cosine on something omega two. What is important here is that one of that expression is mode one and the other expression is mode two. And any possible movement of ball A and B in this configuration are actually simply the sum of mode one and mode two. So once you know mode one and mode two, you actually know everything that can happen to ball A and B. And the only thing which can vary between one specific experiment, you move ball B first or you move ball A first, is the value of the constants A1 and A2. And you now you will be you will have more movement in mode one or more movement in mode two. And in general, the movement will be a combination. And when I may say combination, I mean superposition. And when I say superposition, I mean there's a plus in your equation. Okay? So you simply sum two objects. Now this is an incredible powerful tool because then it makes your life easy. You just need to know mode one and mode two, and then you have a full description of what this system does. And it's um, unobvious, but exceptional. And this is a classical field, but this is also true for quantum fields. And in quantum mechanics, we, we're even more extreme. We don't even write down cos omega one and phi. We just write one and two here, and then we put the numbers A1 and A2 here, and whatever they are, and that is describing in technical words, the quantum mechanical state of the system. Okay, so this is what we do, and it's an incredibly powerful representation to understand things. Now, you you might think the fields are an odd object, but actually they're not. You live it with fields all the time, not only the lake and the stone in the lake, but when you play a guitar or somebody plays the guitar for you, what you actually get is that you have strings, and strings are a field by themselves, and if you pinch the strings, you will have, you can make a note. And the note would be your fundamental mode, for example, which is pinch here in the extreme and can go up and down. But you can actually see that there are other modes on which the screen can resonate and produce music. So this would be, for example, your note. And then 
you have what is in music is called harmonics, the other things that can vibrate while you are pinch while, while you are playing your guitar. Okay, and these are actually the same thing as before. These are mathematically speaking the possible and allowed modes, and these are obtained by confining the string using intentionally the word confined to sound quantum mechanical to confine the strings in, in a specific physical dimension. And then this enforces only some modes, which are the ones depicted in the figure. So in quantum mechanical uh, description, when you play a guitar, you're quantizing the mode of the string and you are uh, conf by confinement. So this is the big words and tricks which I am using. But as you can see, I'm using this in a system which is classical and well, well known. Okay, so similar things happen to an electron when it is attached to an atom, to, uh, in an atom. So you, you have the nucleus, which is made of protons and neutrons, and the electron in the conventional depiction is, you know, like the Earth orbiting the sun. Well, actually things are not like this. The electron is not orbiting at all. Your is, is, is confined by the attraction of the nucleus, and this confinement allows the electron to vibrate in different confined modes. It can play only some notes and not others. And what is also nice and interesting is that your electron can, all, like your string in your guitar, can play the main note. You can, you can hear the main note, but also the harmonics playing because they can also vibrate while the main note is vibrating. This can happen also for the electron, which can be in a superposition in being in one note and in another mode, in the harmonic, in another note that the system allows. So this, well, said like this, it's not so odd after all. Uh, so um, you have to accept that particles and particles are not billiard boards, but billiard balls, but they are actually oscillations of some field. Hmm? So if you're happy with that, uh, then you, as I said, you can live in the superposition of the main notes and the harmonic of the notes. And you can do this also when you are in a, when you have two, mo two, two strings at the same time. So you, you throw two stones in your like, each of the stone produces uh, oscillations and modes by themselves, independent from the other, but then they meet together somewhere in the middle, like in the picture here on the screen. And what happens to that point in space, which is pulled up by one mode and is pulled down by another mode, but each, each with their own ripples? Well, it's very simple. You just plot it, put a plus in between the two modes, you get the, the relative weight, the famous constant A1, A2 I mentioned before, and what you get is a superposition of the two modes, simple and plain. So they simply sum up. Everything behaves as if the two modes don't know about each other. This is called superposition principle, which is not very different from what we've seen before of the electron that can vibrate in the atom in different frequency on different notes of your guitar. Okay, so um, just to give you an idea, uh, because I have only a few slides, so I cannot go into many details. So this is an experiment which has been done by many people. I picked one from the web. And you can see that what they did here is what you see on the left is an image of actually single atoms, which have been moved by scanning telling microscopy in some position, and they've been ordered as a coral. So the dark points in the image on the left are atoms, and therefore, what you also see is the gray area, which has a feature on that. And those are, that, well, that's actually an electron in the coral, which is, well, it's confined by the coral. Um, it's in a two-dimensional world. It's in flatland and needs to decide what to do. And instead of behaving like a billiard ball and jumping and bouncing con constantly inside this coral, but in, in any, in all moments, looking like a billiard ball, it actually does something else because it's a field and being a field, it disperses itself, picks a mode that is allowed by the system. And, you know, you look at it and it looks pretty much like the ripples in water because it's the same physics. It's the same fundamental principles which apply. Now, obviously, the questions will be different to describe this, but the fundamentals are the same. So it's not too difficult to accept that this happens once you accept that your electrons are not particles, but they're actually fields, or at least this is the way we can describe them. And they do behave a lot like fields. Okay, so summary, because there's way too many things to say here, but introducing the next talks coming after me, 
the key here is that you have a field and not a particle. These fields have, can live in superposition of the different modes. Uh, the modes are finite. You can have a special rule, which is called entanglement, where you are in a superposition, but then there is an extra rule in there. And this is what the physics allow that to happen, but still in a superposition. And quantum technology is about exploiting these properties and hopefully to get better computing, better sensors, and more secure internet, and a lot more than just this. So and this is the magic of PowerPoint. Thank you very much. And I let you with my computer. Let me now introduce uh, Felipe Murphy, um, who's going to talk to us about uh, the second quantum revolution. Uh, hopefully, he's going also to introduce us to the first quantum revolution. Uh, Felipe is uh, leading a team on the quantum modeling within the material theory group. Thank you, Jorgos. We are currently at the very start of the second quantum revolution. What is this? And what does it mean for you and me? Well, quantum is already a big part of our natural world. The colors that we see uh, come from electronic transitions between quantum states. Our vision comes from similar transitions of quantum states to excite neurons and produce images. Another natural example is photosynthesis that happens when sunlight promotes quantum chemical reactions that produce energy for plants. And chemistry is seen as scientists' first control of quantum, even before the underlying principles were known. The first quantum revolution happened when the principles of quantum mechanics were discovered. Realizing that electrons and light behave as waves means that they can be controlled by changing the structure of the materials they're in. The electrons interfere with each other to create energy gaps. These energy gaps are really useful. They can be used to produce switches, such as in transistors, which drive most of our electronic devices. Transitions across the gap produce light, as in the lasers used in medicine, communications, and manufacturing. Superconductors are really quantum, with electrons moving without resistance that produce super powerful magnets uh, nowadays used in hospitals um, in MRI scanners. Atomic clocks used in GPS and mapping uh, use quantum, atomic quantum transitions that keep ultra precise time. And solar cells use transitions across the quantum gap to generate energy from the sun. This brings us to the second quantum revolution. Increasingly, over the last few decades, we have been able to manipulate single quantum states. This opens up amazing new possibilities. Because the states are so sensitive to the environment, we can use them as ultra-sensitive sensors. Today, they are being used for intrinsically secure communication, for simulating quantum physics. Well, simulating quantum physics is actually very hard using conventional computers. So using quantum simulators based on quantum states would make them many, many times faster. And quantum computing will allow us to solve algorithms that were previously impossible to solve, bringing solutions to areas such as new chemistry for medicine, textiles, and energy, new algorithms for logistics, for solving pressing problems in the allocation of resources, food, and energy, new algorithms for market prediction, and as I said before, intrinsically secure communications that cannot be breached. And ultra sensitive sensors being currently tested uh, to read brain states with high resolution. As scientists, we are really excited to be working on these new possibilities for improving life every day. 
Thank you. For the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, take a deeper dive in terms of what we are uh, doing or why we are interested in here in terms of uh, um, quantum uh, technologies at Tyndall. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, what we are looking at is really, or traditionally, Tyndall is about uh, information processing and how we can build the technology bro uh, blocks for information processing and how we can apply this information process processing into the various uh, uh, life domains, whether this is information and communication technologies for uh, the medical sector or whether this is for the agricultural sector or the communications in, 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 um, uh, in general through over a fiber or for, uh, as an example. Uh, what enables all this information processing at the heart of that has been uh, one of the things that uh, Philip mentioned before, uh, which is the invention of a transistor and uh, how uh, this transistor has been put together into the millions and the billions and uh, through Moore's law that most probably you have heard before about the possibility to um, double the power on, 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 a, on, on a single um, chip uh, every, every two years. Uh, but while this has kept us for a while, um, it is becoming increasingly more difficult. And uh, there is also other issues. Uh, there are very hard problems that we now realize cannot be solved um, using conventional comp computing uh, that is based on the architectures that we have. So uh, people have started working and ourselves in uh, alternative information processing technologies. And quantum computers is uh, allow for these alternative information processing uh, technologies to be uh, realized. So Philip mentioned the second quantum revolution and the first quantum revolution as well in terms of allowing us to, to, to do what we, we have today. But for the quantum computer, there are essentially two uh, properties from the quantum science that uh, Emanuele has already introduced before. Uh, one is the superposition, is the superposition, quantum superposition of states. So typically the unit of information in a, in a computer is, uh, is, uh, is, is a bit uh, and it, uh, it, it goes from uh, the state from between two states, zero and one. And that can live on, on, a, on a sphere. But uh, what, imagine if we could use the whole sphere, how many more states we could have if we could get a superposition of all the states from a sphere in terms of uh, being able to do um, computation, to store information. Uh, actually, Emanuele gave a, a very good example in terms of the uh, harmonics and uh, how these are um, uh, used in, um, and how, how these uh, are uh, related to the sounds that we, we hear. I imagine if we were only able to do uh, music with just uh, two notes, dun, 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 zero and one, zero and one. That would be extremely boring, right? But the, uh, the harmonics actually allow us to, 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 to have this complexity in the music that uh, we, we carry with us every day. It's the same with the quantum superposition uh, when we use it for quantum computation. It allows for uh, many more things to happen. The other property is uh, the superposition of the superpositions of the entanglement as uh, it was introduced by Emanuele a little bit earlier. So in this case, what happens is we bring together uh, two qubits, we, inter we, we, we entangle them, and then we allow them to propagate. And even when they are very far apart, they still carry information uh, about each other. And this is something that uh, we can use in quantum computation. Now, before we talk about quantum computers, it's good to understand uh, where we're coming from. So I'll take a historical digression uh, in terms of the classical computer. Uh, here you see the first digital computer um, uh, 
from IBM back in the early fifties. Uh, uh, actually, the whole computer was was uh, was taking the space of a room. What we see here is just uh, the the logic, the circuitry logic module module that is based on the vacuum cubes and the uh, tubes and the uh, resistors and the inductors and all these. But then the transistor was invented based on the first quantum revolution and um, was integrated onto a circuit. And since then, we've been living the Moore's law that I mentioned at the, at the start that allows us to um, uh, put more and more transistors together. In fact, back in the 70s, the first commercial uh, integrated circuit made it to uh, this application, which is a, a, a desktop uh, printing uh, calculator, uh, which transf transformed the um, accounting um, profession. Uh, at, at least, uh, you know, now, you know, if, if someone wants to cheat uh, in terms of uh, accounting, you know that they need to know um, not just clever mathematics, but they need to know uh, the programming language uh, of um, to, to be able to change uh, the, the calculations inside that chip of that uh, uh, calculator. And of course, with the evolution of, a, of a integrated circuits, we, we now have um, billions of transistors. Uh, this is uh, as, as many as the population on the, uh, or at least projected, uh, the, the population on the, on the world um, on, um, on just a, a very small um, a chip. Uh, and that uh, can be integrated on everyday devices, on the computer that we use for this presentation, or your mobile phones that you, you use on, for everyday communication. Now, the quantum computers are actually at the very similar state as the classical computers were back in the 50s, right, and the 60s. So we are reliving that, 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 that revolution uh, here is the first um, uh, commercial type uh, quantum computer, uh, which is the size of the room. Uh, it uh, has a fairly clean uh, environment. This is the, another technology, uh, which is uh, essentially um, used also for experiments on quantum computation. And you can see it's a, it's a much more messier um, uh, job. Uh, but uh, can we use already, you, you could ask, can we use you know, these quantum computers already to do something that qu classical computers cannot do? Uh, and the answer is yes and no. Uh, it, is, uh, it is only very recently in the last uh, uh, year or so that um, a, a computational advantage, uh, advantage has been demonstrated uh, using these quantum computers as we have managed to put more and more qubits together in the same way as people have be previously been able to put more and more tran transistors together. Uh, but at the same time, uh, while the, the, the computational advantage has been demonstrated and 10 to the 14th, in fact, uh, uh, claimed that uh, a calculation has, done, has been done uh, in much faster in t uh, as compared to a classical computer by a factor of 10 to the 14th. That is, uh, let me see, an equivalent would be how many stars would be in the largest galaxy in the universe, right? This is the, the top, the, the, the numbers we're talking about. Uh, while this has been demonstrated, the actual application uh, is not very useful yet. So we have a really long way to go, even to be able to go back and have this <laughs> this is a very clever calculator. Uh, now, uh, or the equivalent of that, I should say uh, more correctly. Now, in terms of the, to, to have that quantum computer, we need, you know, the, the fundamental of quantum mechanics that Emanuele has uh, introduced. And we also need to have the applications um, and, and, and imagination on, on the hard problems that we are able to solve. But essentially, between those two, we, what we need to do is really to process data, move data, store data, and manage, or in other words, communicate and analyze this data. And for that, there is a whole stack that we need to be working on. 
We need to be working on the actual realization, uh, as I showed before, of, uh, of the quantum computer. So these are the fundamental technology building blocks that will allow us the physical uh, um, realization and engineering of, uh, um, of the computer, and also the interfaces with the classical uh, world. And this is the microarchitecture and how we put it together with, with, in, in a system. This is the system architecture, but how we talk to it, right? And the way we talk to it is through the, the, through the programming or through the software or through, through the user interface uh, uh, that, that one can build. And then we need to understand what we can do with that. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, complexity, in terms of communication, in terms of algorithms. So how can we uh, develop um, the, really the, uh, the ability to solve the hard problems that classical computers cannot solve at the moment? And this is the business that uh, uh, Tinder National is, Institute is, is uh, in, right? What we are doing is we, we engineer in quantum science. We realize, we make things for uh, being able to use the quantum mechanics and uh, build those technology blocks for the quantum computers. And we, we have um, several uh, technology blocks that we are uh, working on. Uh, I, I picked up, a, at the, at the highest level, uh, some of the, of the issues. Um, one is really how can we integrate new materials or find new technologies where we can actually uh, have a realization of qubits, not at, what, uh, not at the temperatures that is done at the moment, which is actually the zero, uh, the absolute zero uh, degrees uh, temperature. Um, but at a higher, at a, at a slightly higher temperature, so where we can have portability, we can have uh, a better control uh, and and better integration uh, to to scale the uh, the qubits, and how we can also um, develop uh, other uh, technology blocks uh, based on traditional semiconductors with the control and readout instructions, the interfaces, in other words. To, to the quantum computer. And we are also looking at um, the, uh, how we can use photons for uh, doing a quantum computation and also uh, communication. And this is a topic that um, uh, Gediminas Yuska is going to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, within, with his uh, deep dive into uh, a quantum experiment in the lab. We are in the spectroscopy lab where we study our structures called quantum dots. So these quantum dots are a tiny bits of semiconductor material which emits, uh, for example, light. And that light is, can be described only by very strange quantum mechanical laws. And uh, there is a very big application for that kind of light. And so one specific example is a quantum computation. So this is a future technology, which is unfortunately very hard to build. And the main reason is that quantum objects are very fragile. So they tend to lose their, environment, their quantum properties and um, they practically become useless. So typically that kind of labs are designed to minimize these problems. And in that kind of lab, we typically find some sort of fridge. Uh, in scientific terms, it's called a cryostat. And, and that, for example, helps to, to, to get rid of those problems by cooling the sample. And once the sample is cold, the quantum properties are very, uh, become very pronounced. Uh, so here we have our, one, of, one of the cryostats where we can place our sample and study its properties. So typically, the study of these properties is done introducing some sort of perturbation. So this could be uh, current, this could be laser, and in our lab we typically would use uh, lasers and some of them are as trivial as laser pointers which you can buy anywhere and the other ones are way more sophisticated uh, scientific instruments. So for example at my back there is a, a energy tunable laser which uh, allows us engineer the laser light and by engineering that light 
we can probe, we can control the properties of these our quantum dots. So typically we would be sending that laser to the cryostat and seeing the response of the quantum dot. The usual response is that uh, the quantum dot emits light. So all that sets up is our built huge bulk microscope where we can collect that light and see its properties. So typically we'd be using conventional charge coupled devices to see the properties of the light and also we use very specific built for the purpose detectors like for example like this one which is a single photon detector and uh, this detector is special because it enables detecting and showing the quantum properties of the light so specifically it proves that the light once emitted from the quantum dot is emitted in a very portion small portions of light called photons and these photons can be used in the quantum computation um, the whole picture can be way more complicated though these photons which act as single particles can create networks uh, which can be then used in the quantum computation. So this is the future technology and this is what we are working on. So uh, thank you again, uh, Emmanuel and Philip and uh, Gediminas uh, for uh, this uh, introduction. And uh, we have set up here now a, a panel um, for the audience. And uh, I have asked uh, Alida Zawers uh, on behalf of the general public to ask us uh, some questions and we will try our best to uh, respond to them uh, with, the, with the quantum magic ball that we have in our hands. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much everyone for your talks today. They were very interesting. So I have a couple of questions to maybe pose to the panel. So if you do feel like answering it, please raise your hand and I will come to you then. So the first question um, I would put to you is, quantum science um, has been in the media an awful lot in the last two years. But how long has the field of quantum science um, been around for? Is this something relatively new or has it been in the background for quite a long time, but has only come into the forefront now? So, Emanuele, do you want to jump in there? Uh, yeah, so quantum physics and quantum mechanics, different names for the same thing, has been around for actually way more than 100 years. It's the end of the 19th century where the first results measurement came out showing that things were not the way people thought. Um, now it took quite a few years across the two centuries and in the first 15 years to understand what's going on. There's all sort of odd results uh, in terms of expectations. Um, and then somewhere in the middle of the 1920s, incredibly fast, all the puzzles Get to, got together and made sense. So between half the, the 19, mid 1920s and early 1930s, quantum mechanics looked pretty much as it looks today. There's a lot of been a lot of progress afterwards, but you know the fundamentals have been there and have been put there in just a few years in the 20s. Um, it's rather an extraordinary thing to be honest. Brilliant. Perfect. Yeah, well, so yeah, there, there was there was a big um, change in in the way that quantum but uh, quantum mechanics has been understood in I think it was the seventies and eighties with uh, with some new understanding from Bell, for instance, from Northern Ireland um, that allowed the the new wave of of quantum to to come uh, the sort of the second revolution to come in terms of communication and quantum computing because um, this new understanding is. It's, it's a new way of looking at old, um, at old physics, but uh, it allowed a, a, a quite a new revolution in technology as well. Very good. Perfect. So we've talked about maybe like Tyndall's involvement in this research area that, that's going forward, but how is Ireland as a whole um, contributing to this quantum research area? So Ireland is, has a rather vivid quantum community. Um, quantum is first and second generation, so a revolution. So um, quantum physics research and quantum technologies are part of the research which is happening in Ireland. There's a lot of really good theory. Um, there is a little bit of less technology applied to second quantum revolution at the moment. But we're making the transition now and there's funding agency now uh, which are pushing for us to build 
a quantum technology in the sense of the second quantum revolution environment. And so it's happening now. Um, I've been one of the people pioneering these type of things when the name quantum technology didn't exist. Other people in Ireland, in other universities have been doing the same. Now it's a question of collectively joining together forces here in Dinville and elsewhere to make this community grow and jump and do good research and hopefully get good devices out. Brilliant. And Jorgis, do you want to chime in there? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, echo a little bit uh, Emanuele's uh, thoughts there and I, I tell a little bit about what we are doing at the moment. Uh, uh, we, there were pockets of excellence uh, you know, uh, in, in Ireland for the last uh, 10, 15 years and definitely Tyndall was leading the way in terms of the realisation and Emanuele's team in particular in terms of the realisation of uh, quantum um, science uh, and engineering. <clears throat> now, uh, around 18 months ago, uh, Emmanuel and I wrote a, a position paper around um, quantum's, uh, uh, the Ireland's quantum future. And since then, we've seen that uh, the community that was out there uh, started aggregating and uh, we, it, it, it worked like a, an avalanche. And uh, we see that uh, uh, the research uh, is aligning around uh, um, certain themes, particularly quantum computing, uh, where um, Ireland has a, a traditionally strong position in terms of uh, all the electronics industry that uh, sits behind it. And um, at the moment, we are uh, working at the, uh, the National Advisory Forum has been established uh, last year, and we are working within that forum to uh, develop the strategy, uh, the national strategy uh, further. Uh, the ecosystem is there, uh, uh, but we need more focus and alignment um, to, to, to drive this forward. Perfect. And then the last question I will post to you all now. So this is going to take on a different stance, maybe for those who are undergraduates or those in secondary school who are thinking of going into a STEM career. Um, so you were all kind of working in this quantum research area, um, but I'm sure you probably came from different paths before you got to this particular uh, research role. So my question would be, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in pursuing a career in STEM but who may then want to actually delve further into the quantum research um, area. Yeah, I could start there. Um, I would think a, a strong math background is, is good. I mean, this is all dealing with waves and states, superpositions, entanglement, and uh, uh, math is, um, is, is very useful in this case. Uh, then physics, a uh, general physics education, or, Doing quantum quantum physics, of course, would help would help a lot. Um, and if you want to go more into the engineering side, electronic engineering, I would think it gives us a very strong background on on, on even these ideas. Um, Perfect. Anybody else want to chime in there or any yeah, advice for the uh, companies? I would say um, this is the right moment to be doing this. Um, I, I, we are very excited. We're so excited <laughs> uh, to to be living this, uh, um, you know, uh, this dream. Because um, I, 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 my background is physics, and uh, like the the other two guys, and uh, we've learned about quantum physics in um, uh, in the university, and uh, maybe also a little bit about like properties, depending on your background in secondary education, right? Uh, and um, it, it was it was so abstract, um, um, very much philosophical. Uh, now we can actually realize this, right? We 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 can do things with uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, we can engineer uh, technologies with uh, for with quantum mechanics, and um, that that I mean that. Um, uh, option there, uh, or broadens a lot the horizon in terms of the of the STEM careers. Uh, Philip mentioned, right? You you can have uh, 
uh, quantum engineers, uh, you know, with an electrical, uh, electronic engineering background, or quantum engineers with a, with a physics background. Uh, you can have uh, quantum technologies with a chemistry background, so, uh, because you need the new materials. And uh, quantum information also, right? You can quantum information, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so it, everything is, uh, is new and there are so many uh, exciting things to discover and, uh, and do. Um, this is not the case for uh, many other disciplines. And uh, don't be scared of maths. I mean, you know, uh, you can always use a quantum computer in the end. So. Well, there's also, there's also the, growing, the growing field of um, uh, programming these quantum computers. Yeah. Um, and that is a different skill set as well. Um, there, there are now courses on how to make algorithms for, for these computers, which are essentially different from the, the typical computers. And that's another area that, 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 that will grow, hopefully. Very much, yeah. I think the take home message here is that this is an area that's just going to continue to grow and concepts that that were taught about a couple of years ago are becoming realizations now so it's probably a good time for students to maybe opt into pursuing a career or a, a research path in this area going forward because it's it's where the, te the technology and the research is is going these days and um, thank you very much everyone for, for your contribution today we have so many questions that we could have asked um but we would have been here for hours um, so thank you very much for your time and for your presentation